Well, good morning, church. It is time <laughs> to get started. Uh, so good morning. Welcome to Sunday morning worship at Pepperell Christian Fellowship. My name is Archer Bachelor, And whether this is your first time at a church ever, or your first time at this church, or your thousandth time, we're glad you're here. God loves you and has brought you here this morning according to his good plans. Let's start with a few announcements. Uh, just a quick one about parking. Reminder, uh, you may have seen this in the PCF News. Uh, don't park right there. We want to leave enough room for walkers so they don't get squeezed against the traffic. And also, if you do park in the library, that, that parking is available on Sunday mornings for us. Uh, just walk on the sidewalks. Uh, we want to avoid wearing paths into the grass. Uh, next up, uh, PCF has our all-church gathering coming up on Monday, March 20th. So mark that in your calendars. Lots to do that evening. Uh, we are going to approve three new uh, vote to approve three new deacons. Uh, we'll be updating the membership role, um, establishing a full-time pastoral residency position that we've been talking about. So that'll be up as well, and uh, discuss the allocation of a gift we received recently. So uh, these meetings are where the membership body uh, does the business of the church, um, considering basically how we can best fulfill our mission our mission to speak gospel words and do gospel works to display the worth of God to the world. So it's a fun time to think through how do we do this best with what God has given us. Uh, only church members can vote, but others are welcome to come as well if, if you want. Uh, and speaking of membership, uh, we have a membership class coming up. So if you're not a member, here's how you can become one. Uh, PCF, church membership uh, it does enable you to vote at the meetings, but it's primarily, and more than that, it's a way of saying we want to pursue Jesus together. We're going to be part of a community. Uh, so it's about committing to love one another, be on mission together. So if you consider PCF to be your church home, this is a time to express your commitment in that way by becoming a member. So we have a membership class on Sunday mornings during the Adult Education and PCF Kids Hour uh, in April and May. I think, uh, yeah, that's coming right up. And uh, we'll discuss the history of PCF, the mission, what makes PCF distinctive, uh, why is membership important, what does it involve, uh, there's no obligation to become a member at the end, so it's also just a good way to learn more about PCF if you're, if you're curious. So uh, if you're interested, just email uh, Stephen Whitmer. Email address is there to sign up. Uh, lastly, for announcements, I just wanted to remind people, we have excellent, an excellent church library in the back and lots of good resources there. I've benefited so much from different Christian books over the years. And uh, recently, I've been just getting some of the children's books from the library. It's really easy. You just fill out the little card in the back and put it in the box and just read them a couple times in a week, and I swap and get another one. So it's a fun way. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone of that. Okay. So at this time, let's start to clear our minds with these announcements I just gave. Let's set aside thoughts about the week's activities. We're here this morning to worship God, and to proclaim his excellence. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 67. Let me just preview the flow of the psalm. It starts by asking God's blessing, then explaining the purpose of God's blessing. That is that God may be known to all people, and that all people will praise God and fear and respect him. And the good news is this sort of fear of God is also what brings us gladness and joy in our lives. So listen as I read Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. 
God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. This is God's word. Now let's turn and read the Lord's Prayer together. And uh, it's over here. Uh, Following that, I'll uh, continue in prayer as we prepare to worship the Lord in song. So let's start by reading the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Father, we need your daily sustainment like we need food and water. Indeed, more than we need food and water. Please help us to do your will. Please protect us from temptation. And please forgive our sins. Please help us now to focus on you as we praise your name, that you may be proclaimed holy and awesome here and now. And I pray that you will help us to show your worth through the way we live our lives and through the words we speak day by day. Amen. Please rise and worship Jesus, who took human form and came into the very world he created. Jesus, Lord. 
Jesus, you became sin for us, the innocent lamb slaughtered on our behalf, bearing the full weight of God's wrath. You are the offering for our sin. You are the firstborn of the dead. You are ruler of all the kings on earth, our resurrected Lord, our atoning sacrifice, our high priest, our advocate before God, the judge. In you alone, we have forgiveness. And now you are seated at God's right hand, crowned with glory and honor. Amen. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of light. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Mystery slain by death, the God of 
Please be seated. As a church, we have uh, a calling and a passion for planting churches. Many of you know that we recently planted Christ Church Townsend in Townsend, Mass. And we are part of a collective of church planting churches. So in the pastoral prayer this morning, I'm going to pray for the members of the Village Green Collective. And you can see here where the stars are that we have uh, churches in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Redemption Hill Church, First Baptist, Cornerstone, Rivertown, Christ Community Church, River of Grace Church, Terra Nova Church, PCF, and we should add Christ Church Townsend (laughs) in uh, Townsend, Mass., Uh, We praise God that God's called together a whole group of small town churches committed to planting small town churches. And we gather regularly as a collective of churches, pastors uh, getting together. In fact, we're hosting later this month at PCF, we're hosting uh, a day-long gathering of the Village Green Collective pastors. So I want to lead us in prayer right now for this team, this group, these churches And ask God to allow us to plant more churches together and grow an even sweeter and deeper fellowship and partnership. Let's pray. Lord, it is to me a life-giving and extraordinary thing that you have called not just us as an individual church to plant churches, but you've given us people who have already planted churches and other churches who really care about planting small-town churches throughout New England. And you've allowed us to partner financially and to partner deeply relationally. I think of the pastors of these churches who I I know very well now. And we've confessed sin to each other and hurt and struggles. And we've told our stories and we've spent days together. We've, We've gone on retreat multiple times. We've spent Uh, Long, long hours of strategizing and planning and praying together. And we want to, as a church, Father, we want to pray for these churches on this map. For the leaders, for the people. We're going to ask you, Lord, for the members of the Village Green Collective, each of these churches, that you would preserve among them a fidelity to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they would not get bored with the gospel, tired of it, would not desire to move on to other things, but would be even more deeply amazed that you would send your son so that whoever believes in you would have eternal life. That would be bread and drink. It would be exciting. It would be transformative day after day after day. Please ensure a fidelity to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, for these churches that you'll give them, each one, including us, a love for you and for neighbor and a persistence in personal evangelism and remarkable unity that will demonstrate the presence of God. Wherever there's dissension, wherever there's maybe conflict, hard feelings, tough relationships in our church or in any of these churches, we pray that you would bring by your spirit supernatural unity to display your own worth. Please provide financially for these churches. Many of us are small. Some of us struggle. 
Please strengthen and encourage leaders when things are difficult. Please, Father, promote in these churches a big heart for global missions, a passion to see your name globally proclaimed in in new cultures, in new languages. Please give a tender heart for the poor and marginalized. I pray, Lord, that you will bless the upcoming day of planning and discussion and prayer later this month as the Village Green Collective pastors gather here at PCF. And we pray that you will allow us as a group of churches to encourage one another and get to know each other more deeply And Father, to fulfill our mission of being a group of small town churches in New England, planting small town New England churches together. We pray that Christ Church Townsend will be the first of many churches planted by the Village Green Collective. And beyond what this one collection of churches is doing, we pray for our region, for New England. We pray that you'll bring more Christian workers here. Pray that that you'll raise up more Christian workers from within New England. And Lord, we pray that each of us would be Christian workers on mission in our everyday lives. We pray that you will bring revival to this region. That those who are professing you would live full out radical lives of dependence upon you. And would be faithful in evangelism and faithful in gathering with the saints, and faithful in obedience to you in our everyday lives. And we pray, Lord, that you will draw men and women and children to yourself, people who don't know you and haven't been transformed by the gospel, that you'll draw hundreds and thousands to yourself. Use the Village Green Collective. Use the churches throughout this region. Use us but work by your Holy Spirit to bring new birth, to bring new life, and to draw people into saving relationship with your Son. Lord, as we hear that word from John 3 today, I do pray that it will be transformative for us. Um, I pray that the word will come with power here and power in Dexter and Lewiston and North Adams and Ware and Townsend and every place where the Village Green Collective churches are and throughout New England, you will attend the preaching of your word and by your spirit move among your people. We need you, Lord. We are dependent upon you and expectant for you. And so come, we pray, and be honored in Christ's name. Amen. Kids, you can go to Children's Church if you're second grade or younger, out the back door, across the deck to the front building, and I would invite all of you to open a Bible to John chapter 3. Anyone who needs a Bible, just raise your hand in the air, keep it up a minute or two so one of the ushers can see you and get a Bible to you. And as that's happening, I want to welcome again, add to Archer's welcome earlier in the service, anyone who's visiting, we are honored and glad that you're here. And I hope that you won't be able to to get away this morning without being greeted by someone. And uh, if you would like to know more about us, we have welcome packs in the foyer. They're on the table as you leave to your right. Grab one of those welcome packs. There's a welcome card in there. And if you fill that out, you can ask for a pastoral visit. You can get on our mailing list. If you want to know more about our church, we would love to let you know more about us. And we'd especially allow, uh, love to get to know you better. Also, just want to mention two things quick here. Uh, many of us are reading through the whole Bible in two years. And for many of us, this is the first time we've ever read straight through the Bible. And I want to hold this book up to you, which will be helpful for you. As you're reading through the Bible, some of you have wondered, I, did, I created that Bible reading plan over two years. You've wondered, why did I choose those particular passages? In many cases, it's because of this book, How to Read the Bible, Book by Book. It's a guided tour of every one of the 66 books of the Bible. And if you use this as a companion, when you're reading difficult books, like, for instance, Leviticus, which we're in, in right now, you might be wondering, what's all this stuff here for? Like, what, why all this detail? 
This book will help you not get lost in, in the forest, um, not, not get confused. And it'll give you the larger context. It'll help you to make sense of what you're reading. I should also mention this week on my pastor's blog on our website, I linked to a 10-minute video by Tim Keller on why Leviticus matters and why it's important. So if you're wondering that as we conclude Leviticus, go check out my pastor's blog this week and watch that 10-minute video. One other thing, uh, Christianity Explored is coming up. And I am so grateful for uh, the number of people who come to our church, many of whom are, maybe you're not totally sure where you're at spiritually, what you believe about God. Um, Some of us maybe do believe in God. We we do believe in Christ, but we feel sort of weak or immature, and we'd love to get a, a, a better picture of what the gospel is and just understand more. Christianity Explored is uh, a course that we're going to be starting um, in just after Easter, so about a month from now, and it's a seven-session course that gets at the heart of Christianity. It goes through the Gospel of Mark over the course of seven sessions, and it explains what the Gospel is. And we're going to be running a whole bunch of sessions of Christianity Explored, many, many groups, both one here at the church, many in living rooms around this region. And if you've never heard the gospel before, if you have heard it, but you'd like a refresher, love to invite you to join one of those courses. And you can email the church office, info at pcfchurch.org, and we'll connect you to one of those groups who are going to be going through Christianity Explored. I think it'd be um, just a great experience for you to be part of that. All right, we're going to be in John chapter 3 this morning. So if you have a Bible, please open up to John 3. And I'm going to read our passage, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. Last Sunday, maybe you remember if you were here, at the very end of John chapter 2, we saw that Jesus can see right into the heart of people. He can see not just their appearance, but their, their inner spirit. And this morning, we're, we're beginning a sequence of dialogues. We're going to see Jesus engaging with people and seeing right into the core of who they are. And this morning, we're going to start that by seeing this interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus. This is John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. This is the Word of God. The structure of this passage is pretty straightforward. It's a dialogue between two people, Nicodemus and Jesus. In verses 1 through 3, Nicodemus speaks to Jesus, and Jesus answers him. In verses 4 through 8, Nicodemus speaks to Jesus, and Jesus answers him. In verses 9 to 21, Nicodemus speaks to Jesus, and Jesus answers him. And it may well be that verses 16 to 21 is John the Gospel writer's explanation of Jesus' response to Nicodemus. So that's the passage, Nicodemus, Jesus, Nicodemus, Jesus, Nicodemus, Jesus. Notice one thing that changes in the course of those interactions and two things that remain the same. So first, the thing that changes. In the first exchange, Nicodemus begins with a statement of what he knows. He says, we know, thus and such. In the second two engagements with Jesus, Nicodemus asks questions. And that shift, I think, is significant. Second, notice the two things that stay the same. One is the basic subject matter. So the entire discussion between Nicodemus and Jesus revolves around the question of what is required for a person to be saved. It revolves around the the matter of salvation. Earlier in the passage, salvation is described, you'll notice, in terms of seeing the kingdom. And then Jesus reframes it as entering the kingdom But later, we get to, more explicitly, this language of salvation. For example, in verse 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. And all those are just basically the same, different ways of getting at the same point. We're talking about salvation. What's it it take for a human being to enter into right relationship with God? Seeing the kingdom, entering the kingdom, being saved. Here's the other thing that remains the same. Listen, just listen to a few verses here from those verses I just read. Verse 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you. Verses 10, 11, Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, and now you don't need a Bible degree to notice that repetition, I don't think. Uh, Jesus says three times throughout the course of the passage, truly, truly, I say to you. It's a very unusual way of speaking. It's, in, in, in fact, it's unique to Jesus. Only Jesus talks this way. He says, truly, truly, literally, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Amen is something you typically say in response to what someone else has said, and you say it after they say it. It's your way of saying, well, we say this too. When people pray, we say amen. What we mean is, I hope you know what you're saying when you say amen. Uh, It means, so let it be. Yes, amen. That's right. I support, I endorse that. It's very unusual that Jesus says it twice. He doubles it, amen, amen. And he says it before what he's about to say. And he he says it in regard to what he himself is saying. Amen, amen, truly, truly, I say to you. In other words, he's guaranteeing the absolute truthfulness of what he's about to say. This is kind of like when the prophets would say, thus says the Lord. Jesus is saying, what I'm about to say is absolutely true. I endorse it, I stand behind it. So I want you to hear this. The words we're going to examine in this passage come with the full authority of Jesus Christ behind them. These are not just mere opinions. They're not someone else's opinion. They are the words of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus himself. They, they, they take this, this solemnity. They acquire this seriousness because Jesus says them 
and because Jesus guarantees them. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus is speaking of a subject of supreme importance, the eternal salvation of human beings. And he does so with the utmost earnestness. This is the Savior explaining salvation. So it's like Da Vinci telling you all about the Mona Lisa or Michelangelo explaining to you what he was doing on the Sistine Chapel. This is the Savior solemnly unpacking for you the significance of his salvation. So is this important? Yeah, it's absolutely important. Is it precious? It's absolutely precious that the Savior would explain his work to us. I want us to look very carefully at it. And I've been praying that these words would correct any false impressions we have, any misimpressions, misconceptions about salvation, that these words would open eternal life for some of us if we've never experienced it. And also that if we have been saved, if we have experienced that, but maybe we don't know the full glory of it, these words would produce a deeper gratitude in us, a deeper awareness of what it is that's already happened to us. So let's see what Jesus says here in these words about the new birth. We'll see that salvation requires our new birth, and Jesus' death, and our belief. If we're going to be saved, we need to be born anew. Jesus needs to die, and we need to trust. Look how Nicodemus is introduced in verse 1. Now, there's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So he's a man of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a Jewish group that were, were particularly concerned with Uh, making sure that they were ceremonially clean according to the law of Moses. So they were quite strict. Uh, Nicodemus was a member of the Pharisees. He was also a ruler of the Jews. So he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. Others were looking to him as a religious leader. Notice that Nicodemus begins by telling Jesus what we know. He doesn't say what I know, but what we know. We know that you are, etc., he seems to be speaking on behalf of his fellow Pharisees and his other, uh, other Jewish leaders, which explains why a little bit later in this conversation, sometimes when Jesus says you to Nicodemus, it's in the singular, and sometimes it's in the plural. I think the significance of that is that Nicodemus is speaking to Jesus on behalf of other Jewish people, and when Jesus answers Nicodemus, he's responding to Nicodemus as a representative of others. So what's being said here doesn't just concern Jesus and one person. It's relevant beyond Nicodemus to the Jewish people and ultimately as well to us. Nicodemus thinks he knows who Jesus is. Verse 2, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. It's a positive assessment. It it doesn't seem like he's opposed to Jesus. In fact, he's even willing to grant that God is with Jesus. Nicodemus is educated. He's religious. He's a leader. He's important. He's respected. He's well inclined toward Jesus. And yet, he's blind. He's spiritually blind. He doesn't see. The kingdom of God, he's missing. God's presence God's power, God's reign, God's salvation are right here in the person of Jesus sitting right in front of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus sees only a teacher, maybe a prophet. He says, we know, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. And if you don't see the kingdom, if you don't see Jesus, the king, if you don't understand that's who he is and what he brings, you're not saved. So this is serious. Maybe you've grown up in church. Maybe you've heard the Bible stories a thousand times. Maybe you've memorized verses. Maybe you, you know all there is to know about the Bible or Christian things. Maybe you were homeschooled by Christian parents. Maybe you went to Christian school. It might be that you even have been given spiritual responsibility over other people. None of those are enough to guarantee that you actually see the kingdom of God. 
None of those are enough to guarantee that when Jesus is right there in front of you, you see that he's more than a teacher, more than a prophet, that you experience the salvation of God. None of those are enough to guarantee that. In fact, Jesus says in verse 3, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's pretty strong, isn't it? You cannot. You're not able to see it unless, in verse 3, there is one way, and it's not being moral, and it's not being religious, it's not being respected, it's not having Bible knowledge. Verse 3, unless, Jesus says, unless one is born again. The only way to perceive the kingdom of God, to see God's presence and experience his rule in the person of Jesus is to be, and this is the ESV translation, born again. Actually, the word that Jesus uses here can mean also born from above. And I I tend to think that's a better translation Jesus says, unless one is born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice two things that are really crucial in that little phrase, born from above. The first is the idea that a new birth, a new birth is required in order to see the kingdom of God. And that's radical. Salvation, Jesus is saying, requires a change in you that is such a transformation. It's such an inner renovation of the whole you that it's it's likened to a birth it's likened to being born from above not just a, a little course correction not just a tweaking of your behavior not not even just a new a new belief but a, a new birth that's what jesus calls it and notice that jesus says you must be born from above. In other words, it, the, the new birth can't just be a human generated reality. It's got, it can't be from below. It's not, it's not birth from below. It's birth from above. Above means heaven. It means God. So this birth must come from God. This transformation, this renovation must come from heaven. It must be spiritual. It must be divine. It's a spiritual birth. It comes from God. According to these solemn words of Jesus, then, There are no exceptions to this. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, so hear this, it's absolutely true, unless one is born again, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the new birth is essential to conversion. It's essential to salvation. Why does Jesus say this so strongly? I've thought about that this week. So I've studied this passage. Nicodemus, he's a religious leader. He seems to be well inclined toward Jesus. He says a nice thing about Jesus. Why doesn't Jesus kind of build the friendship? It seems like Jesus is distancing himself here from Nicodemus. Why does he do that? And I think it's because Jesus knows that one of the greatest spiritual dangers is believing you know him when you don't. And believing you're saved when you're not and believing you grasp the gospel when you haven't. Jesus is distancing himself from Nicodemus because he, he got to warn him. He's got to alert him. He makes it very clear that salvation comes not through a gradual accumulation of knowledge or a change in moral behavior, but through spiritual birth from God. So it's really important that we understand what exactly this birth from above is. It's kind of mysterious. What does it mean exactly to be born from above? And we actually get that unpacked as we follow the dialogue further. So look at verse 4. Verse 4, Nicodemus asks Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? You know, those words, that word born from above can mean above or again. It can mean either of those in the original Greek. And Nicodemus takes it to mean born again. And he takes it in the most kind of crassly literal fashion. He says, how in the world is it possible to be born a second time from your mother's womb? In other words, Nicodemus, although he's a a teacher of the law, though he's a religious leader, he's a Pharisee, He lacks spiritual understanding. And so in verses 5 through 8, Jesus explains what it means to be born from above. Verse 5, truly, truly, 
I say to you, so there it is again, believe this, I guarantee it, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I want you to notice three things about what Jesus says right there. You must be born of water and the Spirit. So first, in verse 3, Jesus says you cannot, this is back in verse 3, Jesus says you cannot see the kingdom of God. Here, in verse 5, Jesus says you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You're excluded from it. And it's basically a different way of saying the same thing. To see the kingdom, to enter the kingdom means to be saved. Second, again, Jesus emphasizes that there's only one way. He says you cannot enter God's kingdom. You're not able to apart from the new birth, no matter how motivated you are, no no matter how intelligent you are, how religious you are. In fact, in verse 7, Jesus says you must you, it's necessary for you to be born from above. It's not optional. It's required. And then third, Jesus unpacks what it means to be born from above. He says in verse 5 that it means being born of water and the Spirit. In verse 6, he says that the new birth is different from your first birth, which is a fleshly birth, whereas this new birth is a birth that comes from the Spirit. And I think here he's alluding to a famous passage in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. So this is the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 25 through 27. Listen to what God promises he's going to do for his people. This is a promise from God himself to his people, Ezekiel 36. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. In other words, God's promising, I'm going to wash you with water. This is a spiritual metaphor. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. You won't be hard-hearted anymore. I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Water and the Spirit. In Ezekiel 36, God is promising. It's just awesome. New covenant promise. I'm going to change you from the inside out. I'm going to purify you. I'm going to wash you. I'm going to take out the hard heart and replace it with a tender, soft, compliant, obedient heart. I will renovate you from the inside out. This was in the Hebrew Scriptures all along. And I think this is why Jesus says to Nicodemus in verse 10. Do you notice what he says to Nicodemus in verse 10? Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? In other words, if you know the Scriptures, if you teach the Scriptures, you should see what I'm saying about being born of the water and Spirit because it was there all along. It was right there in Ezekiel 36. I'm telling you something kind of new, but not totally new because God already promised He was going to do this. He said, I would wash you with water and with the Spirit. Jesus' point, I think, is that salvation is not achievable by our unaided human efforts. It requires God's work. And and that's what he's getting at in verse 8. Jesus says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other words, salvation is a miracle. You can't just add up your efforts and then ensure that you're saved. It's more like the wind when you feel the the breeze on your cheek. You can feel it. You know it's there, but you have no idea where it came from. You certainly can't control it. And Jesus is saying salvation is like that. God, by his Holy Spirit, must give new birth. It doesn't mean there's nothing we can do. We're going to see later. We absolutely must respond. But salvation is not merely the result of our unaided human efforts. When you feel the wind, you can't explain where it came from. When you see someone who is saved, it's not just the result of things they've done. It's not the result of their efforts, merely. 
It's not the result of their intellect or their experience or their background. It was a miracle. Salvation is a work of God. And not just for the really dramatic conversions either. Not just for the ones that really wow us. But for every conversion. Verse 8, Jesus says, So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Every salvation is a miracle of God. And Nicodemus still doesn't get it. Verse 9. He asks, how can these things be? So Jesus' response fills out even more what's required for a person to be saved. He's, he's already just taught that salvation requires a new birth, an interior transformation and renovation. And now he's going to add that it also requires his own death. Salvation requires our new birth, and it, that's within us. And it requires something to happen outside of us, namely that Jesus die. And once again, Jesus will solemnly testify and declare the truth of what he says. Verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you. So believe this now. There's a lot here in these verses 9 through 21, way more than I have time to fully unpack. But I think this is the heart of it. Jesus is saying, if you're to be saved... Not only must God do this thing within you, this new birth, this inner transformation, but he must also do something outside of you. Namely, he must send his son. The son must come and the son must go. The son must descend and the son must ascend. Our salvation requires that Jesus, he calls himself the son of man here, descend from heaven. That's in verse 13. That means he must take on flesh. He must live among us. He must be incarnated among us. And our salvation requires that Jesus, the Son of Man, must also ascend back up into heaven. That's verse 13 as well. Why must he ascend into heaven if we are to be saved? And the answer comes from seeing how Jesus thinks of his ascension. And strikingly, and I think uniquely to the Gospel of John, Jesus' ascension back to the Father begins with his lifting up on the cross. This is really important in John's Gospel, and we're going to see it a lot in the months to come. On the cross, Jesus is literally lifted off the ground. He's attached to a Roman cross, and he's raised, whatever it is, a few feet off the ground. And John looks at, he calls that a lifting up. He sees that as a literal lifting up, but as more than that, as the beginning of Jesus' exaltation, his ascension back to the Father. Look what Jesus says in verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. He's talking here about a story that's told in the Old Testament book of Numbers in chapter 21. And if you're joining us in the Bible reading plan, we're coming to this fairly soon. Numbers chapter 21. The people of Israel have rebelliously complained against God again, and God brings judgment upon them. He sends fiery serpents, uh, poisonous serpents among them. And the serpents are biting them, and many of them are dying, and the people start to panic, and they cry out to God. They're genuinely repentant. And God says to Moses, I want you to make a bronze serpent, a statue of a serpent, and put it on a pole. And if anyone will will trust in me and evidence that trust by looking to the bronze serpent, I will save them. They won't die from their serpent bites. That's what Jesus is referring to here in John 3, he's, he's talking about that story that's told in Numbers 21. Jesus' death on a cross is a lifting up, literally, like that bronze serpent was lifted up. And Jesus says, if you trust in God by looking to me hanging there on that cross, you will be saved. You won't die. So Jesus' lifting up is a literal lifting up, like the bronze serpent was lift, lifted up. But it's also the beginning of Jesus' ascension and his glorification, his return to the Father. And if anyone sees Jesus with the eyes of faith, Jesus says they will be saved. They will have eternal life. 
That's further explained in the the very next verse, which is one of the most famous verses in the Bible. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You can see Jesus' death in that word, gave. He, that is God, gave his only son. He surrendered him to death on the cross. The word only, he gave his only son, shows Jesus' uniqueness, his beloved status to the father, his unique son. God gave that unique treasured son over to death on the cross. And it was the father's love that compelled him to do that. For God loved the world in, in this way, that he gave his only son. Now, Jesus doesn't tell us in John 3.16 exactly why God had to give his son over to death. Why did, why did his love require him to give his son to death? But I think we ought, to, we ought to go back to John the Baptist's words in John 1. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that helps us to understand that the Father's loving giving of his son to death was because Jesus was serving as an atoning sacrifice as a substitute, as a sacrificial lamb who would die in the place of those who were following him, trusting in him. So his death in our place means that we don't need to bear the judgment of God because Jesus has already borne it as our substitute in our place. And this is one of the reasons why John 3.16 is such an amazing verse. Because it's because it's, it's the love of God compels him to send the son who can bear the wrath of God. I mean, did you hear how, how, how complex God is? The, the love of God saves us from the wrath of God. The love of the father saves us from the wrath of the father. It's not the loving son saving us from the wrathful father. It's the loving father saving us from the wrathful father. God loves us and at the cross, he finds a way to maintain his justice and to express his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to death so that we may have eternal life if we believe in him. Our salvation requires that we be born again. There be this interior renovation. We, we come alive. It requires that Jesus die as our sacrificial lamb. And there's one more really important piece. Our salvation also requires that we believe. So look at verse 16 again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. I think what verse 18 is saying is that nobody can be neutral here. You either believe or you rebel you can't sit on the fence you either believe the son and you receive life or you do not and you receive condemnation the stakes are that high and so the the question is will you come will you believe in the son in verses 19 to 21 jesus reveals some reasons that might prevent us from coming to the son he says a love of darkness a love of evil deeds, a fear of those deeds being exposed by the light of Christ. All those things might keep people away from him. And, and you may feel that way. You may, there may be something in you that resists coming to the Son, that, that, that doesn't want to come to the Son, because maybe you're ashamed. Uh, maybe you don't want to give up what you feel you fear you might need to give up if you come. But if you come and if you, you believe, you will, Jesus says, he guarantees that you will receive eternal life. Salvation is no ordinary thing. That's the point of this passage. It's a miracle. It requires God doing an interior renovation. It requires God sending his son and then God giving us belief in his son. In the early 1730s, there was a man about 18 years old. His name was George Whitfield. He was a student at Oxford University, England. He was very religious He fasted, he read Christian books, 
He went to public worship services. He prayed regularly, but he wasn't converted. He wasn't a Christian. Someone loaned him this little book called The Life of God in the Soul of Man, a book that our life groups read just a couple months ago. And as George Whitfield read that tiny little booklet, he learned for the first time that true religion didn't consist in all those things that he was doing, in fasting and going to public worship and private prayer and giving money to the poor. But uh, he said this in his own words. He learned that worship, con- or that salvation consisted in a union of the soul with God and Christ formed within us. And he knew in that moment that he needed to be transformed. That's what was required for salvation. He needed a new birth. And that was a radical moment of discovery for George Whitfield. Uh, he eventually did receive the new birth. He did trust in Christ for his salvation. He became the most famous Christian of his day. He, he was the, the main instrument of God in the Great Awakening in England, the UK, in the US. Uh, he preached all over the world, all over the UK and the US particularly. And thousands and tens of thousands of people came to saving faith through his ministry. But the thing that lit him on fire and the thing that awakened him and saved his own soul was this revelation of John 3, that to be a Christian is nothing less than a new birth. Here's a closing word for those who have not yet believed in Jesus and a closing word for those of us who have. First, for those who haven't, is there within you any kind of a desire to come to Jesus? Is there maybe a curiosity as you've been hearing from the words of Jesus in John 3 this morning? Is there something stirring? Is there at least a curiosity to come? I, I want to invite you to come and to believe. And we've been talking about a new birth. The, the response that Jesus urges is not try to figure out whether God's causing you to be born from above. It's just believe. It's that simple. As you hear Christ proclaimed, as you hear that salvation must come through him, trust in him. Surrender your life to him. Invite him to be your savior. Don't try to be good enough for God. Don't try to impress God. Instead, attach yourself to Jesus, who is the one truly impressive one. Believe in Jesus. That's the invitation for you this morning. And if you do, you will see his kingdom. And you will enter his kingdom. And you will be saved. Verse 18 gives this wide open invitation. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever, that's big. That's big enough to include you. Whoever believes. And then a final word to those who have already trusted in Jesus. In this passage... Jesus is solemnly telling you how you received eternal life. And it's possible that you've received it and weren't fully aware of all that was necessary for you to receive it. And you can receive a gift and not know how much it cost. That happens lots of times with little kids who receive Christmas gifts, and they have no idea what it costs their parent to give them to them. And so it might be that you received the gift of eternal life, but you're not fully appreciative You're not fully aware of all that was entailed. You you don't know that it was a miracle. And you might hear this passage today, this teaching from Jesus, and come alive to an an acknowledgement and understanding of all that was required for you to be saved. It it was not cost-free. It was deeply costly. It was not just, oh, I believe that. It was a new birth, a transformation. You couldn't see the beauty of Jesus unless God transformed you from the inside out. And it doesn't matter if he transformed you, if Jesus hadn't died to bear God's judgment. And you believe, but God, that was God giving you faith. So as you hear this, I, I, I pray that you would, you would grow in your awareness of your salvation, and therefore in your gratitude to God for it, and your praise of God for it. Whoever believes, whoever believes will experience eternal life and will not be condemned. Father, we thank you for this. We thank you that not only do you you save us, but you explain salvation to us. 
And I think you do that so that you will be honored and will experience the joy of understanding it. I do pray, Lord, that you would draw us to yourself. And if there's anyone in this room who's not trusted in the Savior for salvation, as they hear him unpack it this morning, that you would use Jesus' own words to draw every person to yourself. And if, if we're kind of lingering on the outskirts and not, not really, if we're hesitant to come to you because of our deeds, because we're ashamed, because we're afraid, oh God, just melt those objections and draw us to, to the glorious one, to the one who says, truly, truly, I say to you, let us see Christ and believe. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please rise and worship Jesus, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world.
Amen. Please be seated. You can continue your worship as you leave by giving your tithes and offerings in those two offering boxes by the back door. Also, I'd love for anyone who's able to, to remain with us for the 10 a.m. hour. We'll be praying downstairs in a little prayer room. And across the way, we'll have um, children's education for all the way from nursery all the way up through a high school and adult ed for anyone who would like to stay and join us for that. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace.